Hello, Flight TV is on the air, the popular program for people who love the sky. In the studio, as always, is Alexander Shvitkin. Hello, everybody. Flying solo around the world, private pilot Sergei Ananov's story of survival. S7 Airlines becomes the general sponsor of the Russian national team of aerobatic gliders. Prefabricated tent hangers from the company SAUSA. Budget products to store your aeronautical technology. In a story about Moscow's Shevlino airfield, we showed an interview with Sergei Ananov, who planned to fly solo around the world in a light R-22. We scheduled an interview on the show for his return, but Sergei returned without the helicopter. The machinery failed, and the helicopter crashed into the sea between Canada and Greenland. Without exaggeration, half the planet knows about the story of Sergei's rescue from the sea. Federal TV channels, major print media, and online agencies talked about this story for several days. I asked many friends from aviation, did you hear? Did you know about this case? With that, Flight TV correspondent Olga Kuznetsova was probably the only journalist who interviewed Sergei at the start of his flight to his helicopter flight to Shevlina. This is understandable. The interest in AON from the media only appears when some really loud event occurs. Here and now, they talked mainly about his rescue and paid little attention to the fact that it was not a Robinson 44 or 66, but the Model 22. At that time, nobody had flown so far, and to be honest, nobody does today. It is a machine for training pilots in the area of an airport when there is a small route. In New Zealand, they use it to herd sheep. Americans flew from the east to the west coast, Australians from Perth to Melbourne. When I was on the 7,000 kilometer trip, it was a record for distance route. So, well, then I told myself, I've flown 7,000 kilometers easily. I can just do the same for 40,000 kilometers. And that's when I decided to tour the entire world. 7,000 kilometers was Sergei's flight from Moscow to Yakutsk, which he did in a Robinson Model 22 helicopter shortly after he received his pilot's license. And he made the world speed record on a specified route in this type of helicopter. Then Sergei set a record for total distance flight without refueling on the R-22, 1,240 kilometers, and three more records. And this circumnavigation flight was to be the sixth. Nobody had ever flown one of the one-ton helicopters around the world, solo or otherwise. It was decided, done. In preparation for the circumnavigation, Sergei used a non-standard solution. He received a European private pilot's license and took a helicopter with a German registration number. And he received a one-time permission from the Federal Air Transport Agency on the flight over Russian territory. This was an order to be able to fly around the world just in principle. Because I do not intercede in Alaska, you cannot do it. Alaska is the United States. In the US, Russian pilots cannot fly VFR according to the rule of visual flights. Not only Russian, even the North Koreans, the Chinese, Sudanese, Iranians, and still Cubans. But with the European tail number, I was legal in America. No questions asked. And in Russia, there are some questions because here it is the opposite. There is no prohibition as in America, but permission must be obtained and it is very difficult. So there are lengthy negotiations with the permitting authorities and such permission is obtained by way of exception. The most distinctive feature of this flight is that he was solo, alone on the road with no one to talk to, to exchange views or experiences with. It was a difficult flight, of course. I'm a social animal too. So I kept the music. My friend Alexei wrote me some 32 gigabyte instrumentals. It was mainly funk. I flew with the funk. Music saved me. I sang the songs myself. Hitting the road on June 13, Sergei flew almost 34,000 kilometers in 40 days, surpassing a daily average of 1,000 kilometers. And the conditions in the 22 Robinson were not easy. The ergonomics of the helicopter are designed for short flights. In the air, it was very comfortable. I fly, I thank God, but I had to constantly experience the cramped conditions. It is a very hot cabin and a hot seat. Everything is very close. Those pilots who have flown in the Robinson 22 will understand me. When you touch some metal parts, they're hot as flames, and in the cold, it's the contrary, and so on. Here it is necessary to carefully monitor the weight so as not to overload the machine. Everything must be balanced, and there are no hydraulics, so she shakes. It's like a, a scooter, a scooter in the air. In Russia, Sergei flew for five and a half days, and then, to observe the rule for around-the-world flights, he flew 40,000 kilometers in a zigzag route in the territory of the United States. He looked at attractions, met people, took photographs, wrote notes, 
and for the return, Sergei was planning to write a detailed account of his flight. I stopped and met people. It was very interesting. It was hot and cold. So much effort has been expended. Means, resources, energy, and there was even a polar bear under the tail. I traveled 20,000 kilometers through America, Canada, and then the north. And after all that, it just happened that I had to jump into the great water as this technical failure happened near Greenland, quite unexpectedly. The flight took place very well. All of a sudden, there was a blow to the tail. The cabin shakes and shakes, turns to the left, and it doesn't want to pitch normally. I press the pedal and more power is lost. I was trying to find a middle ground with minimal impact to still maintain level flight, but it was impossible. Either the speed is lost or there would be a forced adjustment in my course. I was going between some fog and open water, which was very clear. Realizing that his focus and concentration was not enough to keep the helicopter in level flight, Sergei switched to auto rotation, falling under the fog. He saw a few flows nearby and chose the course, but missed them by about 50 meters. No slow motion there. Everything happens instantly, quickly. That's how it is. No time standing still, nothing like that. Water fills everything. I have time. I have time to detach. At this point, I broke a blade, knocking it to the left. Everything was as I was taught. I stopped all the rotation torque. Then I started to deal with them. And it was just, it was heavier than that side. And it went again to the right. I understand that it was now starting to turn over, and so I found myself under it, and then in the water. Generally unpleasant. I did it back then. Some time was lost as I was trying to balance it. Then I unfastened the straps. I opened the door. Then of course the water comes in, so it means I was already in the water. I go for the life raft. I know what I need at the last minute, to capture some means of communication. The best option was the satellite phone. It was in my bag. I wrapped it in a plastic bag. So I look, but it's not there. It dropped out of the mount somewhere. One hand was rigidly fixed to the panel tracker in reach, but to take it off or to press the SOS took several seconds that Sergei didn't have. So he left the helicopter with a life raft without carrying any means of communication. A few hours later, a plane came. From the sound I heard, even its lights, it flew above the clouds, and of course I did not see it at all. Above the fog, he was flying somewhere high. Descent to low level was against their rules, apparently. But if he had gone down further, under the fog, he wouldn't be in the water. He'd be at about 150 feet. He could fly on the verge of that and see me, but apparently, because they did not want to do so, they flew on. It was useless. He could not fly at all because of dense fog and everything. There were no more planes that day. The next day, a plane flew again, but the fog was still thick. The search also turned out to be useless. In the life raft were three torches, two of them Sergei spent on the first plane. The plane was flying towards me. I was standing with the raised torch. I was ready. I thought, now it seems he's emerging from the mist. Nothing of the sort. It was far too high. They had no chance of finding me. I thought that if they could just divide in the squares, it would take about a hundred square kilometers. The helicopter, it would be ten days of work, after ten hours of operation. And it works for one hour, then it flies. The next day, when I was already on the brink, holding out daily for a moment, I was on the ice. He worked for an hour, but he could have another 10 days to work this way. Based on this experience, on the next flight, Sergei plans to bring at least six torches. Well, in general, he conducted an analysis of what means of salvation and how to get it. For example, you need to take a flare gun, and the color of the powder you spray makes no sense. There is also a powder that the wind sends wafting, and it is painted in a bright, vivid color. I have this whole piece of ice painted with it, but it goes out after two hours. It's not permanent. It is very easy to fade. In principle, I made one mistake, and I cursed myself 500 times for this mistake. I did not show enough perseverance in these last seconds of somehow diving, ducking, but still failing to take a few seconds to secure a means of communication. One of the electronic trackers that provide a satellite SOS signal, for example. As it turns out, Sergei was very lucky. Remaining in the helicopter, the tracker in reach at the moment of immersion gave his last position. And this saved Sergei's life. After all, since the failure of the helicopter and the auto rotation, there was two, three minutes and it was additional tens of square kilometer search, which greatly reduces its chances of success. There are forces that have enough rescue services to arrive at a precise point and accurately remove a person from there. But if the point is drifting, it's a problem. And if there's fog, there's trouble, trouble in the square. 
so my chances of survival drop from 70% to almost 1%. And I understood it's all good. If the ice flow was not there, I'd have opened the raft. A raft was with me, so I was 200% safe from drowning. So I prayed and I told the guys, realize you have to look because I'm still alive. As friends of Sergei continuously followed his flight on trackers, a few minutes later, Andrei Kaplin, Mikhail and Irina Grushina initiated the rescue and gave the coordinates of the tracker to Canadian rescuers. A Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker went to Sergei's position. And in the meantime, the natural owners of the ice flows came to visit, polar bears. The raft protected me from the wind and was a useful means of frightening bears because I was hiding under it and suddenly I jumped out and threw it at the bear. There was nothing else to do. Either he falters or I falter. There were a lot. That's two days the three bears were relatively close to me and they were able to sense and become interested in me. And I was trying to scare them as best I could. I yelled at them, ah! It is not clear at all whether the polar bear is really a land animal or a sea animal. When he's in the water, it's the same as if he's on land. They can swim 100 kilometers by sea and run at a speed of 60 kilometers an hour. Sergei spent a day and a half on the ice just like this, in the cold, soaked survival suit, without sleep, eating protein biscuits. There were these biscuits. I divided them into three parts because I was not planning to stay there and live for more than three days. Little by little, I ate them voraciously. There were even packets of water, well, just half a liter of water in these bags. Very uncomfortable, by the way, the packages. All of this was for a normal residence, not on the ice. There were no burners. I melted the water in my mouth, and I froze under the sky a little bit. I was dying of thirst. Private pilots who fly the northern route, be sure to take into account the rescue set that Sergei took with him. There was nothing for northern latitudes, no torches or thermal self-heating blankets. Sergei, for the umpteenth time in a row, was lucky that the air temperature was just above zero and he did not get serious frostbite, escaping with only slight frostbite in the first phases. And then came the icebreaker. It took them half a day to go the distance which Sergei flew in three hours. At the end of the second day, the fog rose and I could see the fire in the distance, a bright light. No noise, no, just fire. I signaled at last, it was getting dark, it was good, in the dark I could see the third mate, and there were about 20 people on the bridge instead of the usual three. They spotted me in the last second, took a bearing, and sent a helicopter that they had on board. They asked if I could fly. Yes, I could fly. I could fly several miles in a straight line without fog. I could fly, well done. I jumped on board. They did not expect such a hurry from me. I'm well preserved, thank God. The rest of the story everyone knows. The news about the lone Russian pilot who was saved by Canadians was probably in all the mass media of the USA and Russia. Evgeny Maximov, Vladimir Shulman, Murat Mansurov, Flight TV. The most popular, proven, and reliable amphibian flying boat in Russia. Certified structure, extreme simplicity of mastering and flying, super short takeoff and landing distances, just 230 feet. Negligible cost of spare parts and maintenance, less than $30 per flight hour. Very attractive purchase price, just $80,000 for a brand new airplane. Aviation News S7 Airlines became a general sponsor of the Russian national team of aerobatic gliders. At the next World Cup, which is now in the Czech city of Zbraslavica, Russian pilots perform with a swift S1 glider painted in the corporate colors of S7. The application of large passenger aircraft livery on the airframe is just the first such experience in the world. Since the mid-1990s, Russian pilots are regularly champions at flying gliders in the most difficult class, without restrictions. The national team included George Kaminsky, triple world champion, Vladimir Ilinsky, world champion, and Valery Kochagin, Supervising the pilots is the honored coach of Russia, a multiple champion in aerobatic aircraft disciplines, Nikolai Nikitchuk. V91 Aviation Gas for Lycoming Engines, the long proven quality. Airvin Company, the official distributor of the Water Aviation Group the manufacturer of B-91 Aviation Gasoline. The aircraft at the airport are stored under a roof, 
and usually private pilots use metallic and reinforced concrete hangers. But the capital construction of a hangar doesn't always make sense. For example, the pilot will be based at an airport for a few months, or the owner of the airport doesn't allow the building of such hangars. The alternative in this case is the purchase of a tent hangar that can easily be assembled, disassembled, and transported wherever it is needed. Tent shelters for aircraft and appliances have passed severe tests in Siberia and are on sale in the U.S. market. For little money, one can now get much more shelter where you can hide your vehicles and equipment from the weather. In describing the long process, nothing explains so clearly as accelerated video playback. This is the best way to understand how ants build an anthill, the caterpillar spins a cocoon, and a team of workers is building a fast tent hangar. This video was captured by the hangar construction company SAUSA at the airport Pervushina in Ufa, Russia. Despite the fact that the place was not the most even at the airport, the hangar stood at an angle. Installation and construction took one easy day. Even half a day was spent on the adjustment of the gate. A foundation is not required. The Cessna 172, for which we bought the hangar, is now protected from the rain, wind, snow, UV rays, and other weather troubles. The airfield where the hangar is has a guard and video surveillance, so we aren't too worried. However, judging by the conversations of pilots, some are concerned about the safety of property and the tent hangar at times, and if they won't take the expensive plane out of the hangar, the expensive equipment and tools may well endure. The company SAUSA has a solution to this case. Here's how to set up a hangar at other Russian airports. The hangar arch rests on two C containers, which can be equipped with storage, utility, and residential use. Thus, next to the aircraft, a motorcycle, snowmobile, or a car can comfortably fit. The mobility of such structures, in principle, is not less than that of a conventional tent hangar. There are even some pros. The parsed frame is packed in its own container, and if the color of the paint on the containers matches that of the hangar, the architectural integrity of the building will adorn any aerodrome. We have these tent hangars in stock, we also accept orders for delivery at the end of September. For members of the AOPA, discounts are available, so call, write, please. We're always happy to help, to provide a safe shelter for your equipment. The main secret of the strength of a tent hanger is a fabric which snow won't pile up on. Through this framework, the complex can be set up easier and cheaper. And as well, the problem of the foundation is removed. In another video acceleration, you can see as snow slides under its own weight right before your eyes in spite of the very small slope of the roof. In the background, a metal roof with a roof angle of 45 degrees isn't self-cleaning. During the last winter, the observers failed to fix any appreciable accumulation of snow on the roof of the garage tent, and it sagged down at the slightest breath of wind. It remains to add that the list of sizes and configurations of hangars supplied by SAUSA, if not absolutely unlimited, is so broad that it solves the problem of storage for anything from kayaks and motorcycles to aircraft, and quite large ones at that. They're assembled at the factory at the specifications ordered by the customer. Summer is over. It is time to make decisions. Ordering a hangar at the company SAUSA, you can get a safe shelter, save on assembly and foundation, and can always carry a hangar to a new location. Discounts for the first clients. The Russian airline Transaero, under the Flight of Hope, has for several years been flying a special Boeing 747, painted with colored palms. It is placed on the ordinary scheduled flights, and on board during the flight, you can make a donation to the charity fund Lifeline for operations for children with life-threatening illnesses. Recently, the park company added another 747, the nose of which is in support of the center Amur Tiger, and it has been painted with a tiger's head. The goal of the new project is to attract public attention to the conservation of rare and endangered species. We invite you to watch a video on how they painted the plane and think about whether private pilots can do something to support community organizations. I say goodbye to you. If you like the issue, put your likes on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You've been with Alexander Shvitkin. I'll see you.